The Patia City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. Today we've got Dr John Pollard giving a talk and uh, uh, a little bit of enough about John not to try to introduce him, okay? Just to let him, give him the stage and welcome him up. Uh, I could say all sorts of very interesting things about his amazing background. He has some very successful books out there that have been influenced people in their lives. And he's come up with this topic, especially for us, about, you know, we all have problems in life besides health problems, like we looked at last week, etc. And he's going to have a, have open our minds up to ways of opening up our minds. Come on, come on up, John. All right, let's get this party started. Brad, cue music. Music? What music? There's no music. There's no music. You're roll on your own. The, roll the uh, video. Uh, you're going to have to make one first. Uh, uh, start the teleprompter? We've never had a teleprompter. All right, so having fun. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here with the expats. I was thinking I'm an expat twice removed, uh, America to Australia, and now Australia to here. How many Americans are here? US, US, rah, rah, rah. That's a lot, that's a lot. And Australians? I'd ask for UK people, but. Anyway, okay, so today's talk on solving problems. This is a simple talk, okay? But if you get the simple part, it can get as complicated as you want. So I'm pretty sure people here have computers, am I right? So if you have a computer problem, there can only be three kinds of problems that a compu computer can have. So, Socratic method here. Who knows any? Give me a kind of a problem a computer can have. No power is not the computer, it's no power. So that one doesn't count. Yeah, that's a problem but not with the computer. So, malfunctioning hard drive. That's good, thank you, Ren. So, number one problem a computer can have is hardware, right? Something's wrong with the hardware. What's the n a number two problem? Software, yes sir. Let's use software, that's number two. If you have terrible software, your computer won't work right. What's number three? This is the hardest one. Operator is not the computer. Say that again. One more time. Two, yeah, that's again, not a computer problem, but we're talking about computers. What can go wrong? Hardware, software? Yeah. That, let's say it just stopped. So what we're doing is we're thinking of how to solve that problem. Okay. So we know it could be hardware. It could be software. What's that third thing? Well, we could have a driver uh, operating error here. Oh. Now, we've, this has never happened before. Uh, so this could be a problem you could involve in solving. Uh, apparently, some there's a problem with a car parked, and the license it's a Toyota, and it's licensed in Chamburi, and it's Georgian Yoyak, uh, 3372, 3372. Anybody here? Toyota 3372. Gordon, uh, yeah, just go outside. I'll come out with you. The, 
the Thai guy. I don't know why there's a problem, but there you go. So there you go. Is that a good example of problem solved? Kind of. Kind of, yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> operator, again, is not the computer. It's, it's the operator. Okay, guys. I'm, I'm trusting you can do it. We know hardware, we know software. So one more possibility of a malfunctioning computer. Yeah, I'd call that a software or a hardware. Did, did somebody say it? Network, thank you. Thank you, Lord. So you've got a computer problem. It's hardware, software, or the network that it's connected to. So if you have a hardware problem, can you co correct it with software? Sometimes, not really. If you have a hardware, you need hardware, a solution. If your hard drive crashes, software is not going to replace it. If you have a software problem, can you fix it with hardware? OK, but let's say you put that crappy software on a bigger, faster, harder hard drive, what will happen? All right, I think, you, I think you get where I'm going here. So networking is your computer connected to another computer. And if something goes wrong, it's somewhere in between there. So this is a very simple analogy. And now I'm going to up it a little bit. Let's say you have a human problem. What are the three kinds of problems you can have? OK. <laughs> Hand in the back. Physical, OK. That's good. Physical is good. We'll take it. Huh? Relationship? Yeah, yeah, you're right on that one. And mental self-doubt depression, yes? <laughs> hey, this is YouTube. We can't say that. All right, so I'm going to say that a human can have three kinds of problems which are hardware, software, and connectivity, OK? So this is a uh, theory that I came up with many years ago. And it's held me solid the whole time. So I've, I've put my whole life into this logic, and it really works well. So if you have a problem with hardware as a human, what does that mean? Go see your doc. You have what? A, a back pain? Tooth pain? Uh, something wrong with your body, right? So let's call that hardware. Now, this is kind of my background. I, I started life as a chiropractor, and hardware was our thing. We worked on the spine. And it was amazing how many problems we could solve as a chiropractor that involved the mind, mental thinking. Uh, people's attitudes, the way they saw life. Uh, interesting thing about hardware, let's, let's say you have a toothache. Okay, That's an obvious hardware problem. If you went to a psychologist with a toothache, what would they say? Maybe. How would they, how would they? Yeah, exactly. If you went to a MD with a toothache, what would happen? Hopefully. They might give you a drug, let's say. If you went to a psychologist with a toothache, what might happen? Something about, oh, it's in your mind. You know, you need to get, okay. So the point being, a symptom 
um, having a toothache is a symptom, right? And to find the cause of it, you need to go and look deeper. So for a toothache, it's easy. Dental, obviously, everybody would say go to the dentist. But, you know, I've had toothaches. I went to the dentist. They didn't help me. So what about that? Okay. Uh, in this case, it was sinuses. Your sinuses can give you a toothache. Who knew? Uh, but it gets a little more dicey when you have knee pain, let's say, because you have to maybe go to orthopedist or you, you know, I'm a, a chiropractor who sticks uh, knee pains. But the point being, if you have a hardware problem, you need a hardware solution, okay? That's just a logic that is very simple, but it's also very true. Now, uh, software issues. Did you know that human beings can have software issues with the way they think? And this is my area in a way, uh, software for the human mind. Uh, have you noticed inside your mind that you have a conversation? One part of you goes, blah, 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 blah. The other part of you goes, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of walk through life going, oh, that's a nice car. I wish I had one of those. Ooh, that's a good restaurant. I want to eat something right now. Are, are we aware of this idea that we've had inner conversations? Okay. So inner conversations are your software. They are what's running your brain to do what you do in life. And a lot of people thought, oh, I have pure voices in my head, so that means I'm crazy, but it's not true. Everybody has this ongoing inner conversation. So the question is, who's talking in there? Because to have a conversation, there has to be two people, right? If you just have yourself talking, there's no responder. So this got me thinking, what are these two voices? And long story short, one voice is we call your inner parent. This is the voice that you were taught by your family when you were growing up. You're just a little baby and you're going, ah, and everybody's going, ah. so after a while you go, ah, and stick all that stuff in your head. And that becomes your inner parent. It's the way you were brought up, the things you were taught. I know in the Catholic religion they say if they have the boy by the time he's seven, then they've got the man. So all this stuff happens before you're aware of it. And then that's one side. The other side is your inner child. This is who you were as a child when you were born, same as you were then is the same as you are now. Your inner child is who you were as a little kid, and now you're an adult. So what happens is the inner parent and the inner child have a conversation, and that's your internal software. I like to call it the operating system. Your operating system is what we call self-parenting. Uh, who's heard the word self-talk? A few. Okay, self-talk is one way of saying it, but the real way of saying it is self-parenting because what's happening in the dynamic is that your inner parent is parenting your inner child the same way you were parented when you were little. Okay? So whatever way your parents parented you in whatever kind of circumstances those were, that's what you absorbed, and that's what became your inner parent. So it turns out if you had good parents, excellent parents, then guess what? You have excellent self-parenting. Because you're walking around going, I'll do that, I'll do that, okay, no problem. Everything works out. If you've had bad outer parenting, and this is kind of, uh, anybody here familiar with the term adult children of alcoholics? A few, 
AA. I'm sure there's uh, people that know that here. So basically what happens is if you're the child of an alcoholic, either a, 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 a drinking one or even the codependent wife or husband wife, whichever way it works, their problems are so immense that what you get is very little. You just get their problems. So what happens is when you grow up, inside your mind, instead of a healthy, functioning inner parent, you have this uh, destructive, negative voice going, rah, 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 you can't do that, what's wrong with you, why are you so stupid, get it together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my book came out in 1987 and the people who really got it were the adult children of alcoholics because they were trying to become a better inner parent. They knew they needed to become their own loving parent. So they were stumbling around trying to find some ways to do that. And then my book came along and they went, ah, okay. Because basically what happens with self-parenting is you want to become more conscious. Ooh, who's that? The, uh, can you go to the front page of the, of the website? Is that possible? Selfparenting.com? So, first of all, we know what we're doing inside our mind. We're thinking inner parent, inner child, inner parent, inner child. They're self-parenting. Whatever kind of parents you had is the kind of self-parenting you're doing, even though that was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Unless you do something to change it. If it was positive, then you're happy. If it was negative, then you're not. So repeat after me. Practicing a daily half-hour session of self conscious self-parenting. Excellent will safely, gently, and easily replace any and all dysfunctional outer parenting. I feel like Homie the Clown. Do you know that guy, Homie the Clown? Uh, uh, as conscious adults, you can learn to recognize and reverse the negative traits of dysfunctional outer parenting by becoming a positive inner parent to your inner child. So that's the goal. If, if you're not happy with the way your software is running your life, then with self-parenting, you can become aware of what you're doing and you can change it, okay? And it does require half an hour every day in the morning uh, and it's fantastic. So uh, any questions? on this mental software idea, inner parent, inner child. If not, I'll go on, but if there is, anybody hand raising anything? Yeah. One. Yes, Steve. Um, interesting concept. Um, if you say to somebody what you're thinking, and they say, nothing. And you think to yourself, well, that's absolutely impossible. You can't think of nothing. You must be thinking all the time. And based on what you're talking about, how much of that is self-parenting and how much of it is a waste of time? As far as what they're thinking or as far as they're answer to you well the answer to me is I'm thinking of nothing right which is impossible right you can't think of nothing if, if you say to anybody in this room what you think and they say oh nothing you think what you can't be thinking of nothing otherwise you wouldn't exist that's a good point people People are often not happy to tell you what they're thinking because it could be negative and they even know that when they're listening to it. But the point being, uh, another question? 
Uh, yep. Just, uh, um, I first came across Parent Child, Adult, Eric Burns, Games People Play, etc., other of his works. So, do you, uh, in your w works, do you talk about the the adult or the developing adult, as it were, as well as the child and the parental voice? Eric Burns' work came out a little bit earlier than mine. He, his idea is there's an adult, there's a parent, and then there's a child. He didn't know what self-parenting was, which is unfortunate. His version of adult would be what I would call an inner parent who had learned and grown and become a positive inner parent. And his idea of parent was, would be what I call a negative inner parent. So it, if you don't understand the self-parenting part of it, then it's, it's a little bit of a mystery. But once you understand that part, you can kind of catch. Part of the problem is you have an ongoing inner conversation. Blah, 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 blah. You don't know which side is which, right? I had a, uh, one of my students would wake up on Saturday and hear in his voice, in his head, clean the car, let's clean the car. And he would go, no way, I'm not cleaning the car. And then he would lay in bed for the whole weekend because he couldn't move. So he thought it was his inner parent that wanted to clean the car, but it was his inner child that wanted to clean the car. And it took him about two hours of writing this out and doing the steps. There's a step to resolve inner conflicts. And he realized, God, my inner child wants the car clean. So he went and cleaned his car, and then he had the best weekend of his life. So it's important to know which voice is which because that will determine what you do. Any more questions on this idea? So just to follow up on that last point, how do you identify which is the child and which is the parent if you're not you know, conscious of that? Good question. How do you tell which is which? All right, so what we do with self-parenting is we sit down, pad and paper, we say, inner child, how are you today? We have a little introduction. Then we ask a question, inner child, what do you want to talk about? And what we do is we write that out and say it out loud at the same time. This engages the inner parent. When you stop the question, you will hear a voice going, and you write that down. And then you say, thank you, inner child, for telling me that. And then you ask another question. So that's how you separate it. It takes conscious effort. You have to sit down. You have to prepare. But once you follow the steps of the self-parenting procedures, uh, it's all very simple. You, you say things out loud. Your inner child responds back. And oftentimes, when, when you hear your inner child speak, you'll just be going, whoa, <laughs> where did that come from? And the answer is your inner child, but it's, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, on your uh, tables, copy of my books, I got two books. One, self-parent, I got more, but self-parenting is the, the most well-known one. How Relationships Work is also a wonderful uh, book to explain how relationships work because no one knows that. But with self-parenting, you engage a half an hour every day, and then over time, three months, six months, a year, two years, you become so attuned to your inner conversations that you know exactly what's, which voice is which and what to do when something comes up. But it's, it's not easy. One of the things that can, can mess you up is what we call inner conflict. Okay, so let's say in the case of the student, he, his inner child wanted to clean the car and his inner parent goes, no, I'm not cleaning the car, it's the weekend, we have to have fun on the weekend. And because he didn't, he thought it was his inner parent saying clean the car, he, he just refused to clean the car. <laughs> so with inner conflicts, you, what you do is you write it out. There's eight steps. It's, it's, it's quite easy. 
not easy. It's very simple. It's not easy, but it's simple to resolve inner conflicts. First, you have to become aware of them. Okay, that's the first step. So, uh, I have an easy hack for if you're having inner conflict. If you ever hear the same conversation inside your mind for three days in a row, that's an inner conflict. Anybody experience that? I'm sure you have, but you won't tell me. So think about that. Let's say it's, you know, should I move to Hawaii or should I take a trip to the Congo? So you, three days later, you're going, should I move to Hawaii or should I take a trip to the Congo? That's an inner conflict. One part of you wants to do one thing. The other part of you wants to do the other. It doesn't even matter which one is which at that stage. The point is they're having a fight. They're having inner conflict. And you're immobilized. You can't move until you've solved that. Okay. Um, I mean, you can, but unless that goes away, you'll hear it a year later. Should I move to the Congo or should I move to Hawaii? So uh, keep an eye out for that one. That's that's one sign. The other sign of an inner conflict is gut. Uh, you know, something's going on. Your gut's twisting, turning upside down. Something's going on. You need to listen to your inner conversations and figure that out. Uh, by the way, in case you don't know, I'm encouraging everyone to do self-parenting. All right. Any final on the that? Yes. Yeah, I'm interested in. Uh, you know, I've been listening to Sam Harris talk and. Uh, He's, he's into this whole idea of awareness and dropping away from the inner conversation, as it were, and trying, not trying not to think, but, yeah, in a sense, uh, stilling the mind and stuff. So I wondered how that tied in with your stuff about inner conversations. Okay, there is a philosophy that if you just stop the inner conversations, everything will be good. And I'm not a fan of that theory. It's a, it's a logic. It's a spiritual kind of idea. There's been many gurus who, who've postulated that concept. Number one, you're not going to be able to do it. Number one. Number two, if you can do it, it'll be temporary. And you may or may not feel good. I don't know. Number three is, if you've ever heard the saying, the way out is the way through, that same way. The way out is through your inner conversations. Your software is running. It's trying to tell you something. So by listening to it and accepting it and acknowledging it and then using it to decide what to do, that's how life works. Okay. So um, I hope that answers your question. Oh. Um, in Buddhism, you've got uh, something called uh, the monkey mind, mm. which uh, a method of stilling the mind. Mm. You, you're a monkey in a tree, and every branch you jump on is a new idea. And the only way you can get away from the monkey mind is to stop the monkey jumping from branch to branch. This sounds to me like it's almost a part of what you're talking about? No. Oh, thank you. Yeah. The monkey mind is one term, uh, the committee. Has anyone heard the term, the committee? Uh, there are a lot of words for this, what people assume is just mental chatter, okay? In reality, that is your inner conversations and that's your software, so. It's frustrating to me <laughs> that people try to stop the mind, you know. That, uh, anyway, so yeah, monkey mind, the committee. Uh, there's a there's hundreds of names for that voice, and all it means is the people do not know what self-parenting is. That's all it means. 
So, so once you uh, acknowledge an inner, inner conflict like Congo versus Hawaii, what, what do you do then? There's an eight step procedure. It starts with writing it out. So you, it, you don't even need to know inner parent or child at that time. Let's move to the Congo. No, let's move to Hawaii. But the Congo's better for this and this and this and this. Yeah, but Hawaii has girls. And the con you know, so once you acknowledge you're in, a you're in a conflict, you write it out, and there it is right there on the page. This has two advantages. One, it gets it out of your head, because if you don't get it out of your head, it will stay there. And two, it puts it on a page. And then you could actually show that to someone and say, what do you think? And they go, well, you should move to the Congo or whatever, right? It, the idea is you don't want an inner conflict inside your head. It, it's just terrible. It numbs your body, numbs your brain, can't think, can't do things. Uh, yeah, I have a question. This, this conflict, is the purpose to win, one side to win and beat the other? Or is it that one side just says, okay, you win, you know, gives up? Excellent question. So, there's four ways to resolve a conflict. And I'm sure you know this, it's very simple, but uh, one way is for both people to lose, right? If you've had one of those, they're fun. A second way is one person wins, the other person loses, right? They get, the one person gets their needs met, thank you very much, and the other person you know, tail between their legs, goes home. A third way is the opposite of that. The other person wins and the other person doesn't win. But what we're looking for with self-parenting is a win-win, okay? That's the trick. That's why you start writing things out. So you want to be able to move to the Congo and move to uh, Hawaii or be happy with the solution that you come up with, okay? Settling ideally is win-win. Lose-lose is bad. Win-lose feels good. If you win and the other person loses, you go, eh, it's okay. They lost, I win. But in reality, that's not even good. It's not good. In a relationship, if someone loses, that's a bad, bad thing. So we always strive for win-win, and it's very possible. Sometimes you have to gut it out and, and work hard to get there. I have a good story about that in my book. Uh, long story short, uh, the person wanted to go skiing, but there was a seminar that weekend. And there was a desire to go to the seminar, but there was a stronger desire to go skiing. So it was impossible. I couldn't go to the seminar and ski at the same time. So uh, eight steps, worked it out. Wonderful, win-win all the way. In the back, get that man a mic. Uh, yeah, so um, I noticed one of your books is uh, How Relationships Work, and certainly win-win um, probably is one of the strategies for that. But um, what would be your other top tips about um, relationships and making them work? I want to talk about that as soon as we get past this part. So, yeah. Yeah, a question about um, writing it out and quieting the monkey mind type of thing. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it is. Mm. Uh, so um, when you're writing something out, um, you're going to be in your rational mind and I don't have a lot of experience with meditation or quieting my mind, but years ago I did. And what I found was when I quieted my mind, third options came out, alternatives that weren't obvious in just my rational mind. And I had to be at a certain calm level before I could see those choices. And I just wondered, um, you know, what about that uh, interface between the two? 
Interesting idea. Okay, so the rational mind is the inner parent, thinking, left brain. The inner child is the right brain, intuition, artistic. So, yeah, if a lot of times if you can just stop your rational overthinking and, and relax, inside within you will become a, another voice, intuition, has many names. It says, well, don't do that, do this. And you go, oh, okay, that's a good idea. So that's, that's if you're lucky, right? But if you're having a real sturm and drang inner conflict, you need to write it out. And the best part of that is getting it out of your head. You don't want it in your head. You want it out. Anything else? Anything? Okay, so I'm, uh, what am I? I'm, I'm very happy. I'm living the life. I heard this, you know, saying, if you're right on the inside, everything will be right on the outside. Have we heard this saying? It's kind of a cliche. I, I don't like it. But, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm right on the inside, but I am not right on the outside. What's going on here? So I realize it's my relationships, right? I'm, I'm me, I'm, I'm my body, my emotions, and my mind. I'm real happy. I got together, man. But these other people are complaining or doing stupid stuff or whatever. So I thought, I got to find out how relationships work. Like, you know, something's wrong. I got to figure that out. So it turns out that I did. I want to say I know how relationships work. But I also want to say that no one else does. It's just very frustrating. I studied so many books. I read all kinds of stuff. I, I got pieces of it here and there. But honestly, people do not know how relationships work. And, the, and then I found out. So I'm going to share it with you right now. It's going to be very simple. Again, I'm going for simple here. But you can trust this analogy. Uh, it's golden. Okay. We're going to go Socratic method again. Let's say you arrive at a children's playground. What, what is a children's playground? What are, there's three elements to a children's playground. Children is one. Excellent. The infrastructure of the playground itself, yes, so simple. Last one, two of, huh? No, that's that's included. Let's say yes, it's the environment. Okay, you walk up. There's a sign. There's a fence. Okay, so there's three parts to a children's playground the environment, the structures which are in the playground, and then children to play. Okay? So in a relationship, there's three things. First one is the environment. Okay? So let's say you're in a family relationship. What's going to be the environment in general? Home, neighborhood, culture. Let's say you're in a friend, friend relationship. What's the environment going to be? He's, he's good. Wherever you meet, right? Yeah, exactly right. And let's say you're in a work relationship. What's the environment going to be? Office. It could be a telephone pole if you're a guy who climbs and fixes telephones. Right. Wherever you do your work. Okay, so the first thing you could think about if you're having a problem relationship is to say, what's the environment like? Is there something to do with the environment? It's not often that it's the environment, but sometimes it's definitely the environment. 
for example, let's say a long-term relationship, or not long-term, uh, long-distance relationship. You're in Thailand, they're in God knows, the Congo. Makes it hard to interact, right? Just you're not in the same environment. So, in that case, your environment's the phone or Zoom or something like that. So sometimes it's the only problem, and if you fix it, it the relationship gets right back in, in shape. But let's say it's not that often. Now, the second aspect of a relationship is what I call the seesaw, okay? And this is the structure that would, which would be in a, a children's playground. You all know what a seesaw is. What happens if you're sitting on one side of the seesaw and there's no one on the other side. What? Nothing happens. You're sitting there going, Ugh. Let's say you're on a seesaw with someone and then they jump off. Okay. Let's say you're on a seesaw with someone and then they start crawling up to be on your side of the seesaw. As soon as they cross that mid-level point, you're both going to crash. So, in a relationship, there's 12 generic relationships. I'm using this term generic. I'm sure we all know it now. It wasn't that popular back when I came out with this book. But, uh, seesaw one person, seesaw the other person. So, if it's a parent-child relationship, Who's on one side? The parent. Who's on the other side? The child. If it's a uh, boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, okay? So every relationship needs two people, and it needs a seesaw, okay? So the 12, I'll just run through them quickly. The 12 generic relationships, and by this I mean they're in all cultures. All throughout time, humanity has had these 12 relationships in some form or another. Parent-child, sibling-sibling, uh, grandparent-grandchild, cousins, uncles, cousins, that's kind of one category, uncles, cousins. And then one that a lot of people don't know about, but I'll bet there's some here that are absolutely engaged in this relationship, which is aging parent, adult child. Does this ring a bell? Aging parent. Okay, this was one that, when I first came up with this, the, the, it wasn't even a relationship yet. It was like, took all us old geezers, boomers, to get it together to be old enough to worry about our kids. So, all those are family, they're based on genetics, right? Blood, genetics, etc. Now, this, that's five. So social relationships are friend-friend, we all have good friends. Boyfriend-girlfriend has three versions. Boyfriend-girlfriend dating multiple, boyfriend-girlfriend dating single, boyfriend-girlfriend engaged, okay? All three of those are still boyfriend-girlfriend. Then there's husband-wife. Then there's in-law, in-law, and then neighbor, neighbor. Interesting to think, a lot of people have neighbor problems that they don't really think about because it's so kind of weird, you know. But when you really think about it, you can have a lot of different kind of problems with a neighbor. I, in the U.S., there was a book on neighbor law. It was this thick, you know. So... Uh, kind of interesting. That was one that, that one and an adult child, aging parent, were not anywhere in anybody's uh, periscope. Then the third category is work, okay? So here we have coworker, coworker, people you work with. You have your boss and your employee. So, 
in the U.S., that's a big area of problems for people. Uh, so let's see. So, okay, so that's 12 generic relationships, environment, structure, two co-partners on the seesaw. Any questions at this point? So just to, so I get it clear in my head, which one of the relationships you've just mentioned is the self-parenting in a child thing? That one's not on the list, <laughs> but it would be parent-child. Okay. Even, even internal, though, internal. Even though this one seems to be, uh, the objective of this one seems to be more symbiotic, to, to get a the symbiotic relationship between the two rather than that seesaw thing backwards and forwards? All relationships ideally will be win-win. So if that's your question, that's the goal. Okay. If you, if you, there's a, uh, okay. God, what is your relationship with God? He's the big one, or she, I should say. Uh, it's not in the system, but yeah, it, it's there. All right, so one way of, of, I can sit and talk with someone and explain everything about how relationships work, right? Then they leave the room and come back and they don't remember a single word I said. So there's something about this analogy that is almost too simple. The only person I really ever saw pick it up right away was an eight-year-old. And she just went, blah, 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 and everybody went, whoa. She, you know, so, so let's talk about some kind of problems that can happen. Uh, pick a relationship, any relationship that I mentioned. Which? Marriage. Okay, husband, wife. Uh, what you'll learn if when you read my book, and I brought a copy here. I, I can. Anna, can you get my book and maybe show people? Um, there's a role, and then there's a person playing the role, okay? So in a marriage, you have a husband and wife role, and then you have the individuals being the husband and wife. So when you talk about a role, you you're talking about physical, emotional, and mental rules that you would follow. So what's a rule that a husband role should follow? Come home when you say you're going to come home. That's a good one. What's another rule that a husband role should follow? What? Being faithful is definitely part of the role of a husband. Being a provider is the role of a husband. Good. We're warming up here. Which? Don't screw around. That would go under be faithful, I'm pretty sure. So each role has a physical, emotional, and mental rules to it. Okay? So The person playing that role may or may not be following the rules, okay? So let's say a person is a husband and he's faithful, he's a provider, and he comes home when he says he's going to come home. Is that good? Yeah, that's great. Okay, let's say he doesn't come home when he says, he takes all the money and spends it on gambling, and he's got three girlfriends. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I heard that. That's funny. So there's a difference between the role and the person playing the role. This is the point I'm making. And 
when when you play the role well, then you're given a good rating, hopefully by the other person on the other side. If you play the role badly, then it's trouble. So I always uh, like to say, you know, if, if you're watching Shakespeare and the role is being played by, who's a famous Shakespearean? Richard Burton is the role. You can't really complain, right? But if I played the role of Hamlet, let's say, you, you'd all be going, eh, no, no, no good. So in a relationship, once you understand the functional mm, uh, environment, roles, rules, and customs, then you start looking at the person playing the role. And the person playing the role has three different aspects. They have traits, which is are they honest, are they trustworthy, are they a good communicator? There's seven of them. There's the needs of a person in that relationship. If you're in a relationship to meet needs, that's the point of a relationship is to meet needs. So if you have needs, if you don't have the needs that a relationship provides, you're in trouble, right? You're in the wrong relationship because you can't get your needs met. And then the third aspect of of playing your role is tactics. Okay. Some people have good tactics, some people have bad tactics. So when it comes down to evaluating a, any specific relationship you have, you could just go, what's the environment? Problems, yes or no? What role are we playing? Is it the right role? Are we both on the same role? For example, can you have a sister-employer relationship? You could, but it's trouble. It's two different relationships, right? The generic roles are the ones that go together. So boss-employee go together. Si uh, Sibling-boss does not go together. So what you'll find in a mixed relationship like that is that you'll have conflict of interests on every level because your needs are different if you're a, a boss versus if you're a sister. One of the, huh? Yeah, that would be a good start. That would be a good start. Uh, one of my uh, stories in the book was a couple who lived together, married, in their boss's apartment working for the boss the wife was the boss of the husband in the job they were in and it was all in the same environment the house so it turned out they had like seven different relationships all at the same time <laughs> so they had problems but they worked them out slowly so any more questions on how relationships work? Yes, I have one. Um, you have your couple, and let's say they're getting on okay for a long time. We know that if a third person comes in, an adult, it could cause problems. But what about when they have children? The two of them now look upon that situation differently. Yes, you've added extra relationships. The husband relationship stays the same, husband wife, but now you have parent child, two of them, Hus you know, husband, not husband, but male, father, child, female. And I found in my life, once you have kids, the wife pays more attention to the kids than they do to you. So, you know, something to watch out for. Yeah, it it changes the dynamic certainly. Yeah, this this is not. This goes back to your first segment, uh, actually. Okay, I, so I in, experienced an inner conflict, and this is about win-win 
which seems to be the objective. Okay, what about those of us who had dysfunctional families, d dysfunctional parenting, and we have d a dysfun dysfunctional inner parent, okay? I experienced in the last <laughs> uh, segment an inner conflict, and one I was always taught as a child to keep quiet. And so I was afraid to ask the question. And so in realizing it, I, you know, I, I said, okay, so the inner child is the one who wants to ask the question. The parent is the one that's saying, no, keep quiet. Okay, so where's the win-win with that? Because I, the, the, parent, the, the inner child won in this case, and I'm asking the question. <laughs> so I fail to see the win-win, and it seems to me like there are occasions, especially with us that have dysfunctional inner parents, and unless you're talking about a perfect inner parent or whatever, there's always a lose. Okay, you're at what I call step zero. You know you have an inner conflict, right? And you 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 get the wherewithal to to want to fix it. Okay, so you write out that inner conflict inner parent left, inner child right, you get the needs of your inner parent, you get the needs of your inner child, and then you work out a win-win solution. This idea of, you know, just be quiet, what's the need? You know, don't make waves, don't get in trouble. So yeah, no, dysfunctional parenting is, it's, it's bad, you know, it's, it needs to be, quote, fixed, unquote. So, but you, just being aware is step zero. You you got to be aware. A lot of people are walking around; they don't even know they have inner conflicts. They're just, you know, doing the next thing that someone tells them to do. Anything more on how relationships work? All right. So, where are we time-wise? Close. All right. So. As a wrap-up, this is a concept I call generic human studies. And what I thought back way long ago was, you know, we know the answer to a lot of problems, right? There's a lot of problems. But we already know the answer. We just need to know what the problem is. And Generic human studies is a way to put all your problems under nine words, okay? Every problem anyone has in here, it goes under this one of these nine words, okay? And to make it eh, a little more complicated, there's three words at the top, okay? This is what I call a smart system. If you've heard of smart systems or computer software, is it? let's say you want to drill for oil, right? Someone in a room is going, okay, step one, find land, you know, step two, get the rig over to the land. And so the, the oil industry has spent billions of dollars on a smart system to drill for oil, okay? So this is a smart system to drill for problems that humans have. And there's three categories of a problem that you can have these are problems that you control, okay? You, there's lots of problems that you can't control, so th these aren't in that list. The first category is personal, okay? Me, personal. Uh, it's a physical, emotional, or mental. It's one, one of those three. If you have a problem, it's either, per it's either physical, emotional, or mental. Now, if you have a relationship problem, then it's going to be either family, social, or work, primarily. There's a fourth category of professional relationships, doctor, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. But in your personal life, when you walk around, if you have a relationship problem, it's going to be family, social, or work. And the third problem, which I haven't talked about at all, is financial and in financial, you're either buying something, selling something, or borrowing, saving. The whole of generic human studies can fit under these nine words. 
and uh, that's basically what I'm talking about today. And I want to say thank you to Ren. This 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 meeting is great. I'm an expat twice removed. Did I say that yet? Uh, Australia, for, and in Australia there wasn't any expats because we all spoke English, I guess. And then I moved here, and to have this club here is is, is really phenomenal. You guys put on a good show, and it, I know there's a lot of hard work that goes on that we never see. So I'm grateful for it personally. I'm sure everybody else here is as well. Are there any final questions? Because we had questions all through. Oh, there you go. OK. Thank you. So if it's the inner parent versus the inner child, we should always listen to the parent, no? Because he knows it, he's wise. <laughs> it's inner parent, not versus, but on the seesaw with the inner child, inner parent. You listen to both. You would be surprised how smart your inner child is. You would be shocked how smart your inner child is. So once you start doing the half hour sessions and you start hearing that voice from within, you'll be going, whoa, who's this guy? So, you know, you, you'll see. So I isn't there three persons, three, per three people? Inner parent, inner child. Yep. And there's a third person who decides. There's no third person. And who decides then? They have a win-win a relationship. They make a decision. Okay. They go through eight <laughs> steps. So I've made a decision to get on the stage. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that worked. Oh, don't go, Dr. John. So, no, uh, I think this has uh, been a really uh, different style of talk than a lot of talks we have, which are very thoughtful, and you're obviously a tremendously thoughtful person who's put a lot of thought on in the course of their life trying to figure things out. I can relate to that. Uh, and uh, so thank you. And uh, uh, one of the things, before I present this up, one of the things I want to say is that uh, I used to do quite a lot of journaling, and I think this will encourage me to get back into it. So thank you for that. So, okay, yeah, uh, we have a small token of our appreciation. So, uh, yeah, now a really different style of talk than we, we often have, but one that's really encouraging you to think. And if nothing else, you know, get out a piece of paper and a pen and give it a go, right? 